Hello and welcome to Maine Mother Matriarch with me, Louise Berry. My guest today is Dr. Paul Morland. He's an Associate Research Fellow at Birkbeck of the University of London, uh, a demographer and the author most recently of Tomorrow's People. We spoke about how demography has influenced human history, how it's likely to influence human history in the coming centuries, and the problem of birth rates and what this means for geopolitics and economics worldwide. As always, you can find the extended version of this episode at my substack, louiseperry.substack.com, as well as bonus episodes and the MMM chat community. Enjoy. So, Paul, your book before last was about how demography has affected our history. Your latest book was about how demography is going to affect our future. What's your next one going to be on? Well, hitherto, I've been fairly neutral and scientific or social scientific in what I've written or historical. I haven't taken a very strong stance. The next one has the title Procreate or Perish. So as you can tell from the title, neutrality is not its strong point. And it will be arguing that we are heading for a crisis of demography, not too many people, but too few, that country after country is moving into the territory of sub-replacement fertility, that many parts of the world have been in that territory for a very long time now, and that we are seeing the consequences in all sorts of bad ways, and the consequences are only going to get worse unless we change our attitude to childbearing. That's it in a nutshell. Maybe we should start uh, at the top in talking about why demography is so important. There's this phrase, which I'm sure all demographers find incredibly annoying, demography is destiny, which is both sort of true and sort of not true. Um, But one of the things that you make very clear in your writing is that it does have very, very profound effects on human history, Um, you know, right from the very beginning. One of the things that I've learned from reading you, which I wasn't aware of, is that our population as as a, uh, across the world as a species grew very 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 slowly up until really quite recently these enormous effects of in demography are quite a recent phenomenon because we were able to escape from whether we not want to call it the malthusian trap but we were able to provide for much much larger populations and have much much lower um levels of infant mortality only very recently so that's the first thing to bear in mind that basically up until five minutes ago in human history um demography didn't have nearly as much impact on our history but now i think that that's that's all changing so starting with the is demography destiny is one of those annoying phrases and as often as you find it is destiny uh journals will be saying it's not destiny or or newspapers i mean i think we just have to get realistic about it. On the one hand, to think that demography tells you all you need to know, it's the new explanatory key, like class conflict is for for uh, um, uh, Marxists, um, is obviously naive. So if I knew absolutely everything, if I had a God's eye view of the demography of the world in 1920, I would not have been able to predict World War II. So let's just park that. It's clearly not the explanatory factor in everything, partly because other things matter, partly because it's very enmeshed in politics and economics, both as a causal factor and as driven by those things. So it's neither the only thing that matters, nor is it a sort of deus ex machina that is a prime mover, which has no... Uh, causes itself. So it's deeply rooted in history as well as driving history. But on the other hand, what I argue is you can neither understand history nor the current world, nor how things are going to shape unless you've got a grasp of population. So it's a bit boring to say it's one of many factors, but I think more interestingly, you can say it is an absolutely necessary condition for understanding the past, present and future. It's not sufficient So if you don't understand what's happening in China now in terms of ageing, in terms of fertility rates and so on, you can't grasp what the issues for China are going to be. Does that mean if you do understand it, you know what China will be like in 2100? Absolutely not. Does it mean that you can't really seriously start thinking about the Chinese economy, Chinese politics or that of anywhere else without grasping some demographic basics? Well, that I fundamentally believe. And my mission in both the last two books has been to get that out to a popular audience, to explain it as best I can and to get the message over. So we have a society, a world in which people are more cognizant of the basics of what has happened and what's going on. So that's kind of my shtick on 
demography and destiny. In terms of, of, of what's changed in history, very, very broad picture, um, it took from, as I say, from Julius Caesar to Queen Victoria, so the best part of 1800 years for the population of the world to get from about a quarter of a billion to a billion. Now, quadrupling is a big deal, but quadrupling over 18 centuries is really, really slow. And of course, Malthus very well captured that when he said we move forward, we get knocked back. The capacity of the planet to feed the population grows only slowly. And therefore, if a population gets ahead of itself, it will get knocked back by the next bad harvest. Or if And if war and famine don't get you, um, the, the sheer inability of the world to feed um, many more people will be the ultimate constraint. So we'll double and double and double again, unconstrained. There would be hundreds of have been hundreds, of, starting with a quarter of a billion, say, in the time of Julius Caesar. There would have been hundreds of billions by the year 500. And whatever else happened by means of wars and massacres, you could simply have never got near to that because the world could not have fed so many people. So we have this huge human capacity to expand. But there's the basic carrying capacity of the world, which knocks it back and knocks it back and knocks it back. Malthus, grasping Malthus is really important. And actually, interestingly, it was reading Malthus that Darwin said he had his, his, his lights on moment. Of course, if all forms of life, not just human life, are surging and, 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 and doubling and doubling and doubling again, but there's simply not the room or the capacity or the resources then all, all, all life, human, animal, plant, is banging up against constraints. And under those conditions, Darwin said, what's going to favour one rather than another? So I'm going to get into Darwinism, but it's really important to understand that, in fact, Malthus was an important precursor to Darwin. So what changed at about Malthus's time in the UK and then increasingly in more and more of the world is, first of all, we got fantastically better at producing food to the point now that we hugely um, have increased our food production, could perfectly well feed 8 billion, um, whereas we were struggling back in Malthus's day to feed 1 billion. Most people were pretty hungry. So we have undertaken extraordinary pro progressions of technology and ability to feed people and taken away those constraints. And then on the other hand, our technology has also meant that we've been fantastically better at constraining our uh, fertility. I mean, Malthus kind of alluded to contraception. Contraception is very old. It goes back at least to the ancient Egyptians. We read about Onan in the Bible. So all sorts of ways of constraining your fertility. You can have cultural things like a priesthood and uh, religious orders where people are not... So there are all sorts of social and to a limited extent technical constraints on fertility in the pre-modern era. But it's really only as you get towards the end of the 19th century and then fantastically in the 20th century that you get proper technologies to constrain conception. So what's happened is on the one hand, we're able to expand the population far greater than we ever have done. And then on the other hand, we are now able to, and in fact practicing, um, techniques to control that population growth. So the, the idea of the human tide was that that transition went, started in the United Kingdom, spread across Europe, then spread across the world, and where it's hit at different times and where populations have been expanding or falling or stagnating has been a major driver of world history, whether it's uh, the outbreak of wars, the result of those wars, the rise and fall of um, uh, populations and economies. Now, I think we're, we're all through that transition, largely parts of Africa, not the vast majority of humanity is. A lot of Africa is still in there in that transition, but is moving out of it. So the tomorrow's, tomorrow's people was really saying, well, where are we now? And what does the future look like? Um, and, and one of the things, the thing that concerns me most, and we'll get on to talk about this with, with the next book, which will be my fourth book, is the idea that once we can constrain our fertility, which I think is a wonderful thing, we don't have to choose to have fewer than two children. And if we do, in country after country, then there are going to be quite negative consequences, which we are already having to deal with. Just one example of the um, historical effects of demography, which I hadn't really thought about before reading you, is the fact that um, high levels of fertility in Europe, including in the UK, where much of this 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 technology that allowed us to break out of the Malthusian trap originated, um, largely enabled European colonialism because we had an excess of 
youthful population who were willing to go to places like Australia, Canada, whatever, that, that none of that would have been possible if we'd had the facility rates that we have now, you know, for good or ill, but an example of, of, of how historically important this is. Um, so the sub-replacement facility phase that we're into now, sometimes called the second demographic transition, is that a useful phrase, do you think? Or is there, or are there problems with, with viewing it in that way? Well, let me deal with those two, two things. First of all, colonial expansion, you're absolutely right. Um, Europe started to dominate the globe in the 15th century, long before it had its demographic explosion, and it kind of controlled the Americas effectively by accident through the uh, decimation of the native population. But places like India and China um, and Africa didn't succumb to European domination, and in, in the case of India and Africa, control, until European populations of a certain size. But more importantly, you couldn't have had colonial settlerism. You couldn't have had Canada, Australia, New Zealand, as we know them. I mean, India was under British control, but there never had, was a very large population there. But what the British did by being the first out of the Malthusian trap was have the population to expand globally and actually colonize and recreate worlds in their own image. And that's true of the United States as well. Um, so that um, is an absolutely essential part of understanding 19th century history, that the European technology allowed it to dominate the globe, but it was only European demography, which allowed it to remake large parts of the world um, in its own image. Um, so the second demographic transition, well, I don't like that term, because what that essentially says is the first demographic transition you go through what I've said, you go through that period where you've got still high fertility, you've always had it, death rates fall because technology advances, populations expand, and then eventually, for all sorts of reasons, urbanization, um, higher incomes, education, we can go into that, fertility tends to fall from, say, six to three, two or three. And then that, that was the idea, then your transition, over, your population is larger and stabilizes. The idea of the second demographic transition is once you're through that and it's sort of you get into the sort of 60s type world, everyone is individualistic, um, everyone is pursuing personal goals. So you end up with very low fertility rates and your population begins to shrink or you get mass immigration and you have huge ethnic change. The reason I don't think that is that useful is because I think that is a, whereas the first demographic transition is fairly universal. What happened in Britain, say, in the 19th century is happening in Sierra Leone now. So you're seeing big falls in infant mortality, drops in the death rate, life expectancy growing, rising population. And in much of Africa, you're starting to see fertility rates fall. So that pattern's kind of pretty universal. I don't think it's necessarily the case, though, that once you're through that, you get into the 1960s um, paradigm, if you like. And it was actually really only in the 70s that we started to see sub-replacement fertility. You know, the pill becomes universal. Some form of contraception becomes universal. Abortion's very acceptable. Um, and people choose to have small families. Well, we all get, I think, and we would want to get to the long life expectancy part of the equation. But I don't think we necessarily end up in the low fertility part of the equation. I mean, even between, I was just in South Korea last week. In South Korea, women have half the number of children that we have in the UK. So it's roughly 0 0.8 versus 1.6. So even within the low fertility world, there are huge differences. And then there are communities and a limited number of countries which seem to be bucking the low fertility trend. And that's where I think we need a different sort of narrative that says you're through the economically driven first transition. Everybody's got life, long life expectancy. Everybody's got super low infant mortality, all good stuff. That doesn't necessarily mean we move into a atomized, individualistic, um, low fertility world. It means we move into a world where we can choose and control our fertility and where you might choose to have 0.8 as the average woman in Korea has, or you might choose to have three as the average woman in Israel has. And that makes a huge difference. And also, when you start the fall in fertility rates, what's the pattern of that fall? India, for example, has fallen very quickly from three to two. L large parts of India are sub-replacement now. And I think India is going to go very quickly sub-replacement. They've got lots of growth in the works, but they have a problem down the track. 
China similarly went from six to three in the space of 10 years. And even without the awful one child policy, I think it would have fallen very fast as it did among other Chinese communities and other East Asian communities, Taiwan, South Korea, as we've said, the Chinese and Malaysia and so on. Or you can end up like Indonesia, where you go sub three and then you have at least several decades where you're in the two to three category. So I think both when we look at the fully developed world, we can see very differential rates of fertility. And when we look at the developing world moving through the end of its second transition, we can also see very different patterns from those that just plunge off a cliff like Iran, India, although still early days in India and China, or countries like Indonesia or South Africa, where the pattern of lower fertility is much more steady and slow. And I think what it will lead to is a much more manageable demographic scenario. Yes, that's interesting. Okay, so the first demographic transition, I think we can agree, is quite straightforwardly material in terms of its causation. It's just it's just caused by this increased food production, lower mortality, particularly lower infant mortality. And basically, every country in the world responds in much the same way to those technological factors they fewer people die and then over time fewer babies are born yeah and i would say education urbanization and rising incomes those are the three kind that's the trinity which drives down fertility rate so all of those are kind of directly downstream of technological changes whereas the second demographic transition if it if we can if we can group all of these sort of disparate modern phenomena under that banner is much more mysterious in terms of its causation and is much more patchy in terms of how it it doesn't seem to have that inevitable material sort of um effects of technology it seems to be much more fuzzy and cultural um i mean as you'll know religion for instance is an enormous predictor of fertility in otherwise low fertility countries and explaining that in material terms is quite difficult I think it is uh, much easier to look at um, material things as a social scientist. So I did some work um, looking at the, I'm not naturally a, a very quantitative person, but I did do some, some quantitative work looking at the correlation between fertility and income, for example, by country. And in 1970, it was really, really clear correlation. And If you told me a country's GDP per capita, I could roughly have told you I'd have had a very good guess at its fertility rate. If you look in 2020 and you do the same exercise, you find that still works for relatively poor countries. So they're still going through that first demographic transition. But once you get to um, wealthier countries which have moved out of it, you then no longer have that clear correlation between income and um, uh, fertility. It, it kind of breaks down. So, for example, a country like Greece, which is quite a lot poorer than Sweden, has a much lower, uh, significantly lower fertility rate. It's no longer the case that the poorer you are, the higher your fertility. Um, that kind of breaks down. So, obviously, we then want to explain what's going on. And you're absolutely right. What's going on are cultural factors, and they are much, much harder to quantify. Within countries, though, you can quantify fertility by some things. So religiosity, for example, if you look in Israel and you divide the National um, uh, Statistics Organization of Israel, the Central Bureau of Statistics, has looked at fertility by five groups of religiosity among Jews, about 80% of the population. Um, from the ultra-Orthodox to the purely secular. And there is a spectrum of observance and uh, religiosity. I think it's by self-definition. And there's a very, very clear correlation there. So um, if you look in uh, the UK, there's been quite good work on the level of education and fertility. And again, the higher the level of education of the woman, the lower fertility rate. Even better data in the States, which actually goes from didn't um, graduate high school to PhD. And what's interesting there, and I think gives us a little bit of hope, is that every uh, cohort, every group has a the more educated they are, the lower their fertility rate. 
until you compare master's students to PhDs. And once you get to the PhDs, you see a slight uptick. So I think there's a, a sort of modicum of hope there that we, de that we don't have to dumb ourselves down in order to have a sustainable fertility rate, which obviously I don't want us to do. Um, so you just have to work a little bit harder at what the correlates are. And there is a certain amount of mystery in it. I mean, there are another set of things, which is if you look at fertility outside marriage, for example, where you have traditional views on marriage and fertility and where you have um, societies which some feminists might call traditional and patriarchal. But at the same time, you educate women. So they get all the educational opportunities, but then they are not encouraged to have children outside wedlock potentially, or they are not encouraged to combine career and uh, childbearing. Those are the countries with the lowest fertility rates. And again, you might compare a Spain or a Japan or a Greece with a France or a Sweden. So that's not just a few country anecdotes. That's kind of, you know, that's being correlated. Or where men do more housework, it turns out women have more children. Again, there's so there is some social science around this. And there are some things we can therefore take some comfort from and we can learn from. But it's not the very simple, if you want to get your fertility rate down, urbanize your population, get your economy growing, um, make sure people have access to contraception. The, the, correlates, the, the correlates of the first demographic transition are much clearer and more straightforward and indeed more material than those of the second. You mentioned that it's female education, um, at least in the UK, that um, correlates very closely with lower fertility. Is that also true for, for, for male education? Or am I right that actually, to some extent, men and women are, that the, it's, the, two, the two correlations are actually slightly independent of one another? Well, a couple of things I would say. First of all, that correlation itself has broken down over the years. So if you went back to 1970, you would probably have found a lot of the girls who left school at 16 were having big families. And the relatively few girls who were going to university um, ended up having smaller families. But that even that correlation has broken down. So less educated women are now having smaller families. We see far fewer teenage pregnancies. So, so in the UK, the female correlation or negative correlation of fertility and education has somewhat broken down, though it's still there to some extent. Um, I haven't seen the data on men. And I think the problem, I mean, the data tends not to be collected very well on men. Because there's always there are two reasons why we fixate on female rather than male uh, relationship to children. The first is the sheer um, certainty of who the child belongs to. You don't get into any kind of paternity um, disputes. Um, the second is that men can, in principle, have children for a much longer period than women. So if we're looking at people born, say, in 1970 who are now in their early 50s, we can say for the women, they're done. I mean, I've got a friend who had her fourth child at 52, but you know, it's so unusual. So we can say they're done. Now, what did that cohort do versus an earlier cohort? Um, and we can learn lessons. If you start looking at the men, not only do you have the uncertainty about paternity, which I, it's a fringe issue, but it does make collecting the data more difficult, but also men born, I suspect very few men who were born in 1970 are going to go on to be fathers, but we can't know that for sure. So there's also a third thing which makes collecting the data on men more difficult, is that every bit of data we have suggests that the distribution is much greater among men. Women might have no children or, well, I once knew a woman with 15 children, but that's really unusual. So women normally would have, you know, the overwhelming majority of women would have, say, zero to six. Men in principle, again, can have much more varied uh, fertility. So it's more, more kind of complicated in a way. Of course, you can figure out an average from a wider distribution. But that's how we tend to gather the data. And... Um, for that reason, we tend to have much better data on women and fertility. But I think you're onto a good thing. I think we've kind of slightly, I think we're, because that's how we gather the data, we then tend to put everything on women. And in fact, I was asked in Korea, 
how what how can we solve our problem? Not that I've got all the answers or perhaps any of the answers for the Korean. Um, and and that one of them said when one person said, well, should we spend more time celebrating motherhood? And I said, no, spend more time celebrating parenthood. So we have to be careful that that how we gather the data doesn't drive what we think about policy. But come back to your original question. I haven't seen data on men and education and fertility rates. Um, in a world of assortive mating, where the more educated men tend to end up with the more educated women, which is probably more the case now that we have mass university education for women as well as men, I would expect there isn't that much of a difference whether you look at men or women. Graduate men, however, I suppose, um, earn more and perhaps can support uh, larger families or second families and so on. Graduate women are in the same position, but nevertheless choose to have smaller families. It's an interesting question. I can't definitively answer it. Either the data hasn't doesn't exist or I'm not familiar with it. But a, a really interesting question, probably something that demographers should spend much more time looking at and thinking about. Uh, that makes sense because I yes I I had guessed from the data um, that maybe what was going on was some very high earning very highly educated men were 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 not conforming as much to the source of mating pattern and ended up having more children on that basis but I think it makes more sense that actually it's just a lacuna in the data it's just because we're not monitoring the men as closely as we otherwise might but it could well be that you probably find high status high earning men are more likely to have second families for example that's true. Yeah, look at our former prime minister, for instance. He's 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 really doing his bit for the birth rights, and that probably has an effect on the data in a way that it wouldn't apply to high status women. But but I I that that would be just guess and anecdote. Yes, and also I mean just anecdotally, it it seems very obvious that um, very high earning men are more likely to have stay at home wives who might be more willing to have more children because it's less likely to impact on their career. So there are lots of sociological things going on at the top end. But basically, the the consistent graph that I've seen across countries with low fertility is that poorer people have more kids, very rich people have more kids. I think in America, the threshold is something like $500,000 a year. So we're talking very high incomes and people in the middle are having the fewest. And that's is that something we consistently see across countries, not just in, in the West? Yeah, there's broad, broadly, there's a little bit of an S curve. So the highest fertility tends to be among the poorest people and the lowest fertility among the richest. But actually, you know, I've seen data of this from Edwardian England, which is really interesting. That was exactly the case back then. The richer people could get hold of contraception. And, you know, the stockbroker had was, was on the forefront of having fewer children. And the coal miner was still having many, many. But there was a little bit of an S-curve there in that the coal miners, the aristocracy of labour, actually had slightly more children than the very poorest, probably because they could afford, to, in a time when extramarital fertility was very low, they could afford to get married earlier than people who were in um, less secure jobs. And then at the other end, whilst the middle classes and the upper middle classes were having smaller families because they could and they wanted to, at the very high end, the aristocrats and the super wealthy were having larger families. So there's a little bit of an S curve, the general correlation between more money, fewer children, but a little bit of a kink at either end. Um, that was the case in Edwardian England, and I think it's probably the case in a lot of the world today. But that was also at a time where you still had, even at the turn of the century, where you still had quite high infant mortality. So you would expect more of the aristocrats' children to survive generally well that was data on fertility so live births yes okay okay but in terms of children surviving to reproductive age that would be altered by high levels of mortality you're absolutely right the wealthy would have been able, more able to keep their children alive but, but if you actually look at live births however having said that um you probably were, had lower um tendency to lose your child if you were being well cared for and so on so there were probably i mean the data doesn't exist but there were probably more probably more pregnancies led to live births among the better off yeah that would make sense but if you're simply looking at the fertility rate the number of live births per woman that s curve did apply um as far back as edwardian england of course what happened was um the ability to control fertility move through the population. So in those days, it was a pretty difficult and expensive thing to get hold of 
rather clunky um, technology for controlling your fertility. By the 1960s, certainly by the 1970s, it was convenient and available freely to everybody. So what you tell that's very often when you, when when a society is in that kind of stage of development, you will find the better off have smaller families because they have access to um, contraception. And that will be true of a lot of Africa today. Um, people in urban areas who tend to be better off than the people living in remote rural areas will have more access to contraception. A lot of the work that international agencies do and NGOs is trying to spread that technology through the wider community, but it tends to start in the cities where it's um, most available, and is most easy to disseminate. And in countries like Ethiopia, um, you find that Addis Ababa probably is, is below replacement uh, fertility rate already, although Ethiopia is still probably three or four children per woman. And, that, and you will find it spreads out from urban areas to rural areas, but also from the wealthier to the poorer. And so you get a period when wealthier people are more able to control their fertility than poorer people. Yes, and so we're out of that now in the UK generally. I think, for instance, that the drop in teen pregnancy rates that has been very steep um, in this country in the last couple of decades is almost entirely a consequence of the the, the LARCs, long-acting reversible contraceptives, um, which when I was a teenager, you, they weren't they weren't pushed on teenagers especially. I think that there was a view that it was better to say have a coil if you'd already given birth. Um, and now they don't seem to take that view. So you've got a lot of teenage girls getting onto these um, very, very reliable forms of contraception very young. So I think that's probably what's going on. Um, whereas, of course, that's not going to be available as yet in, say, rural Ethiopia, um, even if NGOs are trying to make it so. No, I mean, we've seen a huge, it's very interesting, actually, in the UK, whatever forms of contraception are being used, we fit, we've seen a general decline in the fertility of women below 25. And we can understand why that is. That's come down sharply and, well, sharply over a longer period of time. And then fertility has risen at the older age. But it hasn't compensated for the lack of fertility at the younger ages. So overall fertility has fallen. What happened recently, though, which I think is really interesting and probably not been that much looked at, is that the under 25 fertility rate has fallen off a cliff. And I think that is not about contraception, which has been generally available for decades now. I think it's about Gen Z values. And I'm very worried that we are heading into a much lower fertility rate. We are we're going to see a new cohort coming at the moment at the start of their fertility, but give it a decade and they will be most of the women in um, of fertile years. And I fear that they are going to have a very low fertility rate. So um, anything I do or say or argue is I think against a general trend, certainly in Britain, towards significantly lower fertility. And we've already seen it come down. I mean, it's bobbed around, but kind of, let's say it's come down from 1.8 to 1 1.6. Um, I can only see it coming down if the values of the um, fertile cohort don't change significantly. Is anyone in the UK keeping track of fertility rates at a more granular level in terms of things like socioeconomic status? Because I got to say, in my cohort of kind of um, professional millennial Londoners, um, fertility seems really low, really low, to the extent that I wouldn't be surprised if we were comparable to South Korea, um, whereas other other socioeconomic groups, other ethnic groups are clearly having higher fertility. Is anyone really monitoring that? Do, do you know, particularly in terms of socioeconomic rather than ethnicity? It's scrappy. What I've seen is the following. First of all, that the fertility rate among less educated, lower socioeconomic groups is higher, but not that much higher. And it's fallen quite fast. Regionally, um, there are some areas it's higher, some areas it's lower. London, certainly low. Um, Scotland is very low, for example. Uh, parts of the northeast are a bit higher. It's not enormously different. I don't think any region is much above 1.7 or perhaps 1.75. But there are some regional differences. As far as ethnic groups go, um, the best data I've seen, which is a little bit out of date, is that Sikhs um, and Hindus have a fertility rate no higher than that of the um, white British population. 
Afro-Caribbean simile. And in fact, if you look at Jamaica, obviously they're not in Jamaica anymore, and increasingly they're distant from Jamaica in terms of immigration. But if you look at the Caribbean islands, particularly Jamaica, fertility rate is really low there now. Um, there is definitely a fertility premium among Muslims, but it's not very high. And the sense is it's also declining over um, a generation or two. So I think millennial um, London um, middle class is, is probably about as low as it gets in the UK. But I wouldn't be expecting it to be dramatically different um, in any other region, socioeconomic group or ethnic group, with obviously some very minor exceptions. I mean, I've been in touch with some traditional Catholics. Someone I used to know from 40 years ago got in touch with me and said, oh, I'm a traditional Catholic. My brother's got 14, my other brother's got 12, what am I, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, those people are so statistically insignificant at the moment that they're not, you know, they're interesting, but they're not move, They're not remotely moving the dial at a national level. Can we talk a bit more about urbanisation? Because um, we've mentioned it already slightly in, in relation to contraception. Um, one of the, one of, it is one of the factors that is... Um, blamed if we want to use that the right that is associated with reduced fertility and some people put more emphasis on it than than others south korea for instance is a very very urbanized society which might be one of the things contributing to um its low fertility i've seen statistics suggesting that there is a relationship between people having very small dwellings as they often will if they're living in flats in in a city and people having fewer children but then I guess it's difficult to disentangle because they might have chosen small dwellings because they don't want to have lots of children or whatever, you know, so it's quite hard to know. What do you, what facts are... Or they don't have, they don't have them. Yes, for whatever reason. yes. How important do you think urbanisation is as a factor? Not just thinking in in the last few decades, but actually across centuries, because that's one of the things that we see as part of the first demographic transition, isn't it? Historically, it's a huge thing. When people moved to the cities, they had smaller families. And that goes all the way back to the 18th century. And London was a population sink. Not only did people have smaller families, but they tended to uh, die, die off more in the cities in those days. They were more dangerous places. Somewhere like London, possibly Paris, would just draw people in. And it, you could see it as a kind of population black hole in a way. Um, as, as I was saying, when you get um, contraception becoming available, so it's going to be most uh, first available to urban people. Um, so that's a factor around the world and historically. And then there is the um, fairly well-known concept in a more primitive society, economically primitive society or undeveloped society, where in the countryside, an extra pair of hounds, this is associated with a demographer called Caldwell, in the countryside, an extra pair of hands is useful. A kid can be put to work in the field fairly rapidly. In the town, that's not so obvious. And as you get an, in, as you're urban and you have an urban economy and you can earn an urban wage in an urban society, there's much more premium on an education and on some kind of training or some kind of formation. And without the, um, if you have a very large number of children, it's very difficult to um, provide that at a very high level to all of them. So the uh, South Korea is a great example of that, actually, because as you probably know, for complicated reasons that I can't really speculate on, Korea is an extremely competitive country. There's a huge desire of people to get their children into the best universities. The children study like crazy. And insofar as you can help them along, by means of private tuition, that's quite expensive. So that's one of the reasons I think people have smaller families in Korea. And that's not to say that urbanization isn't an issue per se, but along with urbanization goes a mentality and a possibility of getting your children into the best universities or giving them the best chance in life. And that will relate to having fewer children and investing more of your capital in the fewer children and rather than trying to spread it too widely. As far as the simple fact of um, not having the space, I'm a bit sceptical about that for a couple of reasons. The first reason is people have priorities. So in, in Korea, half the population, as you kind of correctly identified, lives in Seoul. 
And people said to me, oh, we can't afford to have families. The cost of living's too high. The rent's too high. There's something deeply paradoxical about being in a world where historically much poorer societies had far larger families. Geographically, the poor parts of the world have large families. And yet we're saying we can't afford children. So I think it's really about priorities. If you really want to be in Seoul or London and you really want to be pursuing a high end career and that is the most important thing to you, then you will have some real constraints. But if having a family, family formation is your highest priority, then you'll find a way to do it. Um, that's not to say that those constraints on, on people in, in Korea and London are not really serious, nor is it to say the government couldn't do things by relaxing controls on the green belt or um, making childcare more accessible and so on. But if people's real priority is being in the city and leading a high-end, high-career highly um, self-actualizing kind of life. And that is a trade-off. They will trade that off against having kids. Then uh, that's what we'll see. A young couple in Korea could go off to one of the provincial cities, perhaps have a slightly less well-paid career, have more space for their children. It's what people are choosing. And we do see um, urban communities like the Haredim. I mean, you probably may have encountered them in New York. You may have encountered them in London, who live in very, they're very urban, but they still have high numbers of children because that is the most important thing to them. Now, I'm not here to preach you must prioritize having children higher. I'm simply saying we can help at the margins in urban in the urban world. We can help in the margins in government activity, but people will have higher fertility rates if they want to have more children, if that's the most important thing. I mean, I've been lucky. I've lived in London. I bought my house 30 years ago. But if, I, if my wife and I had been faced between having a family uh, as an option, but that requiring us moving out of London, that's what we would have done. But that's not everybody's choice. And I think it's important to understand that a lot of this has to do with choices and preferences, which are a given in a way. And then people will, you know, the world will, uh, deter, fertility rate will emerge from that, depending on what, what it is that people really want. Yeah, we're all descended from people who had 10 kids and two bedroom huts, right? Like this, this is the, this is, this has been the norm historically for people to have children in really wretched conditions. And, you know, some people will say, well, the fact that people are no longer, at least in most countries, having children in those conditions is a good thing. Um, and you will, of course, be familiar with the argument from some environmentalists, from many environmentalists, that plummeting world population is a good thing. Um, I think that we should spend the next, you know, the next little chunk before, before we come to the end of this part of the show, engaging with that question, because that is the, the, you know, that is the, the big argument. When I, when I tell people that I'm concerned about falling birth rates, the number one response that I will get from most people is, that isn't it actually a good thing? Because... We're, we're close to the carrying capacity of the earth. We're clearly being having a very destructive effect on the planet, which I agree. I, I agree on that. Isn't it a good thing they say that we kind of gently dwindle um, as a species worldwide? What do you say to that to that argument? Well, in my in the book I'm working on at the moment, I I suggest there are three reasons for having children: the three P's, the personal, the practical, and the philosophical. On the personal, I think. Um, it certainly made me very happy having kids and now grandchildren. Um, the most important thing and valuable thing in my life. But, you know, that's just my preferences. But if you look at what people say they want by way of children versus what they have, there's a shortfall. If you look at people when they are um, post uh, having children, you know, in their 60s, say, would you wish to have had more or fewer? Most people say more or the same. Very few people say fewer. Um, there are certain health benefits of having children to do with living longer. Certain cancers are more likely. So it's not very, very clear, but there are actual health advantages, it would appear, in having kids. And I think actually navigating the system when you're very old, not having any children to do it is, is very difficult. So I think there are a set of personal reasons. So far as the practical is concerned, um, the problem is we can't shrink our population while retaining the current structure. What happens when a population declines is you have people living longer, which, of course, we want, and then they have fewer children. And so you end up with an inverted pyramid. Um, and what you end up with is a demand for labor 
driven by the size of the population and a supply of labor driven by the size of the working population. And if the relationship between the total population, the working population gets out of sync, you end up now, where are we in England now or in the UK now? Early days of the impact of low fertility. It's 50 years, but we're only now feeling the impact. And we have really sluggish growth. We have massive immigration and we're still terribly short of labor. So I think that's a huge problem. And if people are going to consume labor, it's got to come from somewhere. And then the philosophical arguments, I think, you know, I'm very opposed to this uh, antinatalism of, of, of people like David Bennett. We probably don't have time to get into that, but there's a sort of philosophical argument um, and a religious argument. Coming back, though, specifically to the environmental argument, I tend to be a subscriber to the school of Julian uh, Simon rather than Paul Ehrlich. You may know they had a famous bet on the price of commodities, which Simon won. And Simon very much was pushing the idea that more brains uh, create more productive capacity in the world. I think a young, um, growing uh, world uh, where where life is um, uh, vital and, and young uh, is more likely to come up with the solutions to the problems we have than a world in which uh, everyone's getting grey and we're worrying, overly worrying, and totally focused on how we manage our old age population. I think we can already see countries like Japan, which are getting older, are not coming up with a number of patents and good ideas that they were when they were younger countries. And if we're going to solve the environmental problems of the world, I think we need uh, good young brains to do that. We should see every baby not as another emitter, but as another potential brain to solve the problem. And the human brain is, as Julian Simon said, the ultimate resource. If we are heading to zero carbon emissions in 20 or 30 years, which I think is feasible, if it, or we're told is feasible in much of the developed world, then a baby born today should not be contributing very highly to emissions. I and mean, if you look at the emissions decline in Britain per capita, over the last 30 years, it's been very impressive. I know it's going to be harder going forward, but it, it should be soluble. And I would say the last thing we should do if we are worried about um, the environment is have fewer children. You know, there are so many other things we could sacrifice. Um, you know, if that's necessary, we could travel less. We could heat our homes less. I don't think that's necessary and I don't advocate it. But that, the last thing, you know, if, if, if it were down to me, I would, I'm very happy I had three kids. I'm not suggesting everyone should have six or seven. I'm not suggesting we should have eternal, endless, runaway population growth. But I do think that um, having two to three children should be something that is, on average, obviously some will have more, some will have fewer, as a society should be something which is um, cognizant with or can fit with um reducing our emissions, looking after the environment better. Um, I think economic development, urbanization are ways that you release huge amounts of the countryside to the environment. So there are lots of green reasons for saying not that the population should double and double, we should have 100 billion people and so on, but for saying actually we have a problem with rapid aging and people having on average two to three children should be something that with our ingenuity as a human species, we should be able to cope with at the same time as caring for the environment. Yeah, I find the anti-human um, rhetoric associated with some of this environmental stuff very troubling. I think that all of the, of all of the ideologies currently in circulation, this one is a pretty mainstream one, it seems to me to be really one of the most, one of the most, possibly the most anti-human um, which is somehow sort of excused on the basis of it, I don't know, having having a virtuous brand or something. But I, um, yes, I think there are some quite sinister implications, actually, um, if you think too carefully about something like Population Matters or one of these other organisations, which is really intent on reducing the human population worldwide. Well, it's ultimately um, positioning humans as a problem. Yeah, essentially, yeah. Um, and, and in a in direct conflict with the rest of, with other species and with the planet, um, which, you know, it's not entirely untrue. There clearly are ways in which we have a negative impact on the planet, but actually 
our, our negative impact on the planet has been reducing over time, if anything. And there are lots of ways in which our modern lives are now much, much cleaner and greener than they were even 100 years ago. So it's not, it's not a consistent historical pattern by any means. There isn't this, this sort of unbreakable link between human population size and negative impact on the planet. Now, if you want to be environmentally aware in a developed country, the best thing to do is to move into the city where your uh, amenities will be provided much more efficiently. Your home will probably be much, uh, probably be smaller, but it will also be better insulated. Your work uh, tr journey to work, if you travel into work, will be more likely to be feasible by public transport. Um, so, uh, you know, whilst um, you know, it's kind of a bit counterintuitive in a way, but an efficient urban lifestyle can today be very environment. And of course, you're freeing up space in the countryside um, and more, more, more room for nature, effectively, if we concentrate in the in the city. And have heaps of kids. This is well, not necessarily heaps of kids, but I'm sure you've seen the um, um, Haredi Jewish community uh, renovations that they've done to some houses in North London where they've added an entire extra story to these um, to these um period buildings um, and it actually looks really good because the um because the local council allowed them to do it it's a beautiful example of gentle density um in the urban environment so there, yeah, there are ways around this well i live in a very jewish area and it's a great pleasure to see the streets full of children actually which is not something you see in many parts of london no you really don't and i i, I hear this as well about um having i've never been to south korea um in large part because i have um a toddler, so traveling South Korea is, is not very practical. Um, but I hear that, for instance, there are signs everywhere saying things like children not welcome in this restaurant or whatever, which seems um, fairly pointless given how few children there are. But I suppose you end up when there are very few children, the norm becomes children not being in public life. And so you end up with a kind of vicious cycle of antinatalism. As people get less used to seeing children around, I think they find them more annoying. I mean, it's probably not a very good analogy, but when I was a kid, everyone smoked. And I really didn't mind being in a smoky environment. Now, if there's anyone smoking, I immediately start coughing and feeling uncomfortable. And I, I don't want to draw the analogy to children and smoking, the one I'm very positive about, the other very negative. But I think if people are not used to, I sit in my garden and I hear children screaming and playing and fighting and running around i i think it's wonderful but if you hardly ever heard that and then you encounter it you're probably more likely to be annoyed by it so as fertility rates fall people's tolerance for children falls and i think that's an awful position to be in and it's a, a death knell for a society really is it really likely that this is just going to keep going though i mean it seems it seems very plausible to me that we're going through a painful bottleneck and it's a bottleneck which clearly has destructive economic consequences and so on. And there will be some cultures and some languages which will probably die out entirely. Um, but, you know, you've mentioned your Tradcath friend with 12 kids. I mean, there might not be very many of them, but they're clearly having a disproportionate effect on fertility rate. You know, it seems likely that over time there will be some sub subcultures which are highly fertile. And if they're able to preserve that culture down the generations, they will come to be much more influential. Um, just in terms of sheer numbers. So, you know, is are we likely to reach a point, I know it's very difficult to speculate because we're essentially talking centuries here, but are we likely to reach a point where the fertility drop worldwide bottoms out and what you end up having is some cultures, some fertile cultures becoming much, much more dominant? Well, there's a cultural, as ever, there's a cultural and there's a biological element. So starting with the biological element, it may be that there is such a thing as a pronatal, pronatal gene or a pronatal complex of genes. That means in the past, people didn't have much control of their fertility. And then until the relatively recent past, there were huge social norms about having children. So that gene didn't express itself particularly. And, and where we are today is it's some people have it and some people don't. If we're now in an antenatal age or a low fertility age, then that gene or that complex of genes will express themselves and will come out and the population will become more pronatal just because uh, the pronatal people have children and the antenatal people don't. Now, I don't, I'm not a biologist by any means, so um, I don't know whether that's true. But at a cultural level, it's certainly the case that you have communities uh, 
which have very high fertility rates. We've talked about the trad cats, although the thing with them is I just don't know if they can retain their children. So if you have a high fertility ideology that doesn't retain most of your children, you'll always be a small group having many children and making very little difference. So you have to, if you want those groups to um, actually have an effect nationally, you then need them to be able to retain their children. Um, now, the Haredim, the Hutterites, the Amish are fairly good at retaining their children. Once they get to being very large groups, they will have all sorts of challenges and, and problems and issues. And, and I don't know whether they will be able to sustain themselves when they it can be counted not in the tens or hundreds of thousands, but in the millions and tens of millions. And of course, it will be a very different sort of world. I don't, I mean, I would consider myself um, culturally fairly conservative, but I don't want a world with no cultural liberals. I don't want a world where everybody belongs to some um, sect there with very high walls and very little ability to communicate with each other. I have no problem with such groups existing and thriving, but I think if they become the dominant element in society, um, that could be very problematic. Uh, but nevertheless, one way or another, whether it's through biology or culture, I agree with you, humans will go on. The question is, first of all, how severe will that bottleneck be and how will we cope with it um, from an economic point of view and just from a sort of public services point of view? And secondly, when we come out the other side, what sort of society are we going to have? And that is my challenge back to liberals and antinatalists. Um, do you really want a world in which people like you have simply ceased to exist? And are you going to leave the field to um, people of various, what we would today consider rather extreme or unusual lifestyles? I want to talk more about this geopolitical angle, because the other thing we haven't mentioned so much yet is mass migration, which is obviously one of the solutions that governments are finding to the problem of low birth rates and the economic impact of it. Um but I want to wrap up this part of the show for the um, for the free subscribers, and then after a quick break, we can we can continue for the paid subscribers. So, for everyone else listening, um, what is your latest book? Where can people find it? Where can people find more of your work in general? So, the latest book that's published is Tomorrow's People. It was published in 2022 with a paperback in 2023. I'm pleased to say it is being translated into Korean. It has been translated into Italian and a few other languages are on the way and you'll find tomorrow's people um in bookshops and and on um book book uh, buying websites uh won't name any but the obvious names come to mind um and the next one i'm working on which is procreate or perish which as i say is going to be much more um pronatalist explicitly pronatalist is i hope going to be published next year uh, in 2024. Um, I'm writing it as we speak, and I think I've got a publisher. Um, in terms of my work more generally, so I've done quite a lot of broadcasting, I've done a TED talk, um, various podcasts, articles in the media. I try and collect them all on my website. If you put in Paul Morland, or Paul Morland Demography, but just Paul Morland, you'll find my website uh, fairly easily and there you'll have access to podcast broadcast articles links to the books reviews and so on wonderful paul thank you so much thank you so much for watching that episode of men mother matriarch and for all of your support it means an enormous amount for the growth of the show if you want to hear bonus content an extra 20 30 minutes of conversation with the guest maybe a little bit more personal a little bit less filtered then you can go to my substack at louise perry.substack.com where you can sign up for extended episodes and also bonus episodes and you can also access our chat community you can also support the show by subscribing on youtube or subscribing wherever you get your podcasts and rating and reviewing on apple podcasts is also really great for encouraging other people to give the show a try please also spread the word tell people that you know who you think might like it to give it to give it a shot um, the word of mouth effect is really valuable so we'd really appreciate it thank you so much everyone for listening watching and supporting what we're doing <laughs>